Peter Honigman, founder and head instructor for Best Defense Concepts. And today I'm here with Alan Lusk, and we're going to be talking about John McSweeney. Uh, but before we get to that, Alan, um, I know that you and your son Corey have a business called Cal Visions. Can you tell me what the business does? Uh, the business is a video production company that does commercials, industrial films, how to videos, you know, anything to do with video. Okay. In my background, I started in 1979, right at the uh, beginning of portable video. Before that, it was one inch decks, which were really cumbersome. Then it got down to three quarter inch. And uh, we really got going right at the advent of MTV. We started out doing a lot of local bands. Uh, and when there was a lot of uh, music videos on the air, we tied in and did a lot of local groups. We worked with Sticks, we worked with Poplar Creek. We did uh, a lot of tie-ins with Channel 66. And then from there, we just grew into doing television commercials for them, industrials, how-to videos, and... Wow, okay. You know, do a lot of things. Yeah, <laughs> okay. and you met been, a lot and, of people. <laughs> and so, how long would you say been in the business? Been in the business about 40 years now, a little a over time. 40, okay. yeah. And so before CalVisions, who were you working with or for? I, Did you have your own company before Yeah, that? my okay. own company. It was uh, City Video originally, and then we changed it to Walter Joseph Communications, which was my and my partner's uh, middle names. Okay. And the reason is is that we expanded. We just didn't do video production. We actually worked as a pseudo ad agency and did PR oh, okay. for clients too. So you're still doing that kind of work as well? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, pretty much. It's a little more interesting. My son's a little more adept at uh, social media. I'm getting there, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's important these days, social yeah. media. So, Well, uh, just a brief anecdote about how I met Alan. So I was had my company for a couple of years. I was doing my own kind of uh, promotion, and I had my own website, but I wasn't real happy with how things were going, so I put an ad out on Craigslist, and uh, I think you responded pretty quickly. And I told, you know, we kind of communicated and told Alan what I was looking for, and I do self-defense and martial arts. And he said, oh, well, I'd be a perfect guy for you because, you know, I used to work with John McSweeney. And, of course, I was quite surprised because John was my very first martial arts instructor. So, uh, of course, I had to meet, meet Alan and talk to him about it, and that's how kind of things got yeah. started. What was interesting, too, is that we went back because I, I managed John, and we did uh, a lot of photo shoots and uh, publicity, and I had some pictures with Peter in it in the yeah. background which was kind of interesting very very surprising so uh, it's a very small world um, so Alan how did you first meet John uh, I met John through uh, at the time I had an insurance agency on top of wow. having okay. a video production company and one of my clients was industrial electric supply and the owner Wally was one of John's students Okay. And uh, at the time, I was working on another self-defense program called Protect Yourself. And uh, it actually turned out the guy was a con man. And uh, he flew us out to San Diego, and he had us meet Captain Sticky, who was a crime fighter <laughs> that shoot, shoots uh, Twinkies through a bazooka. Okay. So we went out there, and he shot like 13 shows in, you know, within a weekend. And we realized that the guy just wasn't there. So I was telling that to Wally, and Wally was telling me, oh, this guy, John, he's the real deal. You know, so I, I went and I took classes with him with a friend of mine, John Giever, who later on, like in 80, was actually shot and killed in Jewel oh, really? on the west side wow. of Chicago over a okay. tube of toothpaste, of all things. It wow. was a, a criminal that was escaped, and he, I guess he didn't want to go back, and John just walked in the crossfire. But anyway, you know, I was talking to John, and I realized he was real. I was listening to his background, being in all three branches of the military, the Border Patrol he was in. Mm -hmm. uh, he did uh, bodyguard work for the Kennedy family. Uh, he, a lot, he had a lot of interesting insights into the militia and uh, the underground movements. Okay. So, you know, we got to talking to him, and we thought it would be good to do a television show, a cable show with them. So we approached Metrovision and Berwyn, and they thought it was a good idea. So we shot, I think it was 26 shows, and they were half-hour shows. And it was broken down to his techniques, uh, like the, the hand yoke, the, the blow to the brain stem, okay. you know, the, the defensive moves that were you know, meant to stop someone with knockout power. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I thought, okay, this is interesting. So we went from there, 
And then as we went on, we decided that it might be interesting because how-to videos were really huge when the home video market started. Sure. So we decided to cut those shows into separate tapes, okay. which would tactical shooting, unarmed self-defense, armed self-defense, things like that. And we sold them internationally, actually. We had people, uh, the Australian police, we had the CIA, we had the wow. FBI buying them. Okay. Um, at first I thought, a lot of people, I was afraid that people that weren't so good mm -hmm. would buy it and start hurting people. But it turned out it was all professional people, chiropractors, doctors. Really? It was just interesting, okay. you know, the types of people that ordered it and followed it. Okay. Now, that uh, series was called In Defense of Yourself? Yes. Is that right? Okay. Yes. And so, is do these tapes contain all of that or just portions of that show? Uh, the Unarmed Self-Defense tape one and two was most of that show. Okay. Some of it was actually cut out because we had a lot of vignettes where okay. in the TV show itself we would set up you know, John in an alley being attacked, John walking through an apartment building being attacked. Okay. And we pulled those out and we just went pretty much with straight instructional on the two. After that, the armed self-defense, those were all shot after that because it was successful selling the first two, so we decided to expand it. And then we added on titles, and it worked real well. Then we sold them as a set. Then later on, we worked with International Historic Films and we combined them all into like a two-hour, which is tape. still for sale today. Yeah. Right. Well, that's uh, that's pretty exciting. I've watched a lot of the, that uh, footage, and he's got he's got a lot of great stuff in there, a lot of good material. Um, but I don't believe these are available anymore. Or just that one. No. Uh, historical. No, yeah, okay. we haven't made them digital or anything yeah. like that. And they need to be upgraded somewhat. Okay. To to reflect what's happening today, today. and laws today and yeah. everything else. Well, in addition to the videos now. I've got some books here. Um, so the first one I want to talk about is Battle Axe, A Warrior's Tale. Uh, initially, when you were talking with John about writing him writing a book, it was not about this, which is kind of an autobiography, but it was about something yeah, I was, else. I was talking to John a lot, and his beliefs were that, you know, there are certain bankers in the world, probably 13 bankers that controlled it, the world, and they got together. And... Uh, a lot of conspiracy theories that people call today, but John was talking about this back in the 80s, and uh, he was talking about John Birch Society, he was talking about the Bilderberg Group, and uh, the underlying militias, the black helicopters, and you know the conflict that was coming. And he also believed that these people, which might be interesting today, they talked about these people controlling the arguments between, say, whites and blacks, they wanted this disruption to happen because as people were fighting here, then they would make these decisions and people wouldn't even know what's going on. So it's, it's interesting to see what's happening. And right now, I think it'd be interesting to see BBC, French television, and see what they're reporting is what, you know, to what our people are reporting. Because they're locked into a certain thing while everything else in the world is going on with China and everything else. Yeah, okay, so some misdirection, obviously, it sounds right. like. So instead of that book, he came out with um, Battle Axe. Right, which really surprised me. But, you know, it's funny. I didn't think John would be afraid of anyone. But there was some fear in John for writing a book, talking about all this stuff. He felt that they would kill him back then. Wow. Okay. And, you know, that just surprised me. And it was interesting, too, because later on I was talking to John, and he felt that he was put here as a warrior, and he'd be involved in righting all the wrongs in the world. And he truly believed that even if it wasn't during this lifetime, he believed in reincarnation. And he believed he would come back and be at the center of it. So okay. as you're looking out when things happen, maybe one of those people is John. John, okay. <laughs> I like that. It, makes it, it sounds very interesting. Uh, definitely an interesting perspective. So in addition to that book, then, he um, also put out the Street Karate. Uh, did you have any uh, hand in that book? No, no, okay. I didn't really have much hand. John did that pretty much on his own. I think he did it with Paladin Press. Okay. He contacted them. They worked out a deal. Well, what I I'm working with you and Corey on um, street karate because it's a it's a book of about 35 different scenarios, real life scenarios where martial arts self defense techniques were used. And he goes through and explains, you know, what happened in the scenario and then the techniques that were used. And so my uh, plan is to take this book, which and I bought the rights from from John's widow when I found out that. Um, 
Paladin Press had closed down. I mm -hmm. tried to get the rights from them. They said they reverted back to her. And I contacted her and explained that I was a prior student of his and would like to um, keep that book going in some way. And she agreed um, to, let me, to let me buy it from her. So now we're going to turn that into a set of video scenarios so that it's a little more live and uh, people can get a better feel for um, learning these techniques. It's very difficult to learn techniques from mm -hmm. a book and only a few yes. photos. So um, working on that. Hope to get that out soon. Uh, and then another book that he put out, or a booklet, I should say, Executive Protection, mostly focused on shooting and using a knife either as protection for yourself or as a bodyguard. Did you have any uh, hand in that? No, I didn't. But what was interesting about that book, John brought it to us and was talking. And it was right after the time where Bernard Getz shot the four muggers on the uh, L in New York. And uh, John pointed out, that the book was purchased or sent to Bernard Goetz's uncle, who was a dentist in Florida. And at the time, Bernard Goetz was living with his uncle. And the technique that was used in New York was the same technique, point shoot, that John was behind. So I just found that very interesting. At the time, he didn't want to say anything because of liabilities, but, you know, it, it happened. And John had shown me the address and everything about it, so I, I believe it. Yeah, and I just went, went back and read the accounts for the, the Bernard Getz shootings, and very much like John had described in some of the videos and things I read, you know, just shooting from the hip, shooting one target to the next target, and then coming back again. So it very much sounds like he must have read John's material. Yes. Uh, there was nothing about his training or anything. He didn't really mention anything in all the interviews I'd read with Bernard Getz about it, um, but it just seems oddly uh, familiar. So. Yes. So, uh, as you mentioned, so John was, you know, big in, into firearms and shooting. Now, I understand there was, back then, he had a bit of a rivalry with another uh, famous firearms instructor, Masad Ayub. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. John believed in point shoot. Masad Ayub was aim fire. John thought that aim fire was effective, but at longer ranges. He felt that, I guess statistically pointed out that the FBI said that any, um, firearm exchange within five yards, three out of the four bullets would miss the target. And he was talking about the tacky psyche effect where the fear, and you would tremble uh, and just miss. And that happened to even the best shooters. So John and I set it up where we started posting articles in magazines, uh, like Peterson's handguns, uh, just different firearm magazines. And Masada Ayub picked it up, and he started writing back why John was wrong. And it got kind of nasty for a while, which John <laughs> loved. So he just kept it going. And that's where we got a lot of interest with the CIA and the FBI, military. So I guess they believe somewhat in it, too. Now, did did uh, John and Masada Ayub ever meet, to your no, knowledge? No, no it was not just to my a knowledge. rivalry no, on paper. Just, <laughs> yeah, it was a pretty <laughs> intense rivalry on paper. <laughs> All right. So now you mentioned uh, some of the uh, publications, and I also uh, have here that you had, or he was in Black Belt Magazine, Inside Kung Fu, Soldier or Fortune, American Survival Guide, and some others. What, what kind of articles was he publishing in there? A wide range of articles, anything to do with self-defense. He did things on aging of the martial artist. He did stuff with tactical uh, shooting, uh, people how to set up, you know, attacks with military. Okay. You know, so he was pretty much everything you can think of with it. And I don't have the book, but I think he also wrote a SWAT tactics book as yeah. well. So Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he he was really into it. He had quite a background. Wow, okay. Yeah, it's a lot of a lot of material. Uh now he was also on T V. Uh I know he was on uh, You Bet Your Life with Bill Cosby. Um but I think you told me that there was an opportunity where he could have been on the John Letterman show. David Letterman. Dave, sorry, David Letterman. <laughs> Pardon me. Uh, yeah, we, we contacted Letterman show, and it was interesting because his, his last wife, uh, Marianne, who was Shalimar in uh, public life, she was a belly dancer, uh, he was on a show in uh, Chicago called Wild Chicago, and it was really funny. Uh, with belly dance and his two little dogs running around. It was fast paced and it, kind of like a Letterman thing. So we thought, oh, we'll call him. So we sent the tape out. He loved it. And he called John 
his people to interview him just, you know, to make final arrangements. And then John, John would go between two things. He'd either be the fun kind of guy or he'd fall into the equalizer mode. So, you know, they talked to him and all of a sudden John was this, you know, military guy, very regimented, very tough. And that's not what they wanted on a Letterman show, okay. which was kind of interesting. And then he was on a, a Jonathan Brandmeier, who was a national radio a talk show guy, he did an interview there, and what it was was he was talking about knocking the head off a man, and I guess Brandmeier <laughs> took it literally. <laughs> so he's talking to John, and then John got very intense there too, and that's that's just John. As a matter of fact, with the equalizer, when Edward uh, Woodward had the heart attack, John called me right away and he said, hey, I looked like this guy. I'm the real deal. Call him up. I'll take over. <laughs> and I was like, okay, John. <laughs> Did you reach out to anybody on that? Uh, no. No, okay. <laughs> no, not on that one. Yeah, John was interesting because when we had the business, as we grew, he would just pop in at any time. You'd never know. He was there once when we had Big John Stud from the uh, World Wrestling Federation there. And it was just kind of an interesting meeting okay. that this guy's like almost seven feet and John's there. But Big John uh, Stud really respected John, which okay. was interesting. Wow. So, and then I remember one other, yeah, two other please. little stories. They had, uh, I met through my sister a guy who did a South Korean style, and he had a lizard whip kick. So <coughs> I was talking to him, and at the time I was managing John, I said, yeah, come on, let's go down. We'll meet John on, uh, in Elmhurst, he had the school on York Road. So we went over there, and all of a sudden there was just this tension. You know, he cut it with a knife. It was just, they both sizing each other, looking at each other. I'm like, holy cow, what's, what did I get it into? He did the same thing with Mr. T, too, the bodyguard. I did work with Mr. T. Oh, really? Okay. And, uh, yeah, John had met him somewhere, and John was telling me, I looked at this guy, yeah, he's not that tough. He doesn't look, I can take him. I can take him. It's like, okay, John. <laughs> well, okay. So he's volatile. Yeah. Well, he was also very, you know, I remember him, I studied with him about three years, uh, and I remember being very passionate about what he was teaching. He was always very um, down on traditional martial arts, at least from a self-defense perspective, and talking about how you know the focus was always wrong. That if you're trying to learn how to defend yourself, most traditional martial arts weren't going to work. And how you know Kempo, where he got from Ed Parker and kind of modified it, was a far more reality-based, I guess, self-defense. Yeah. Well, he so. really, when he had the school at that time, he really didn't believe in belts. Right. He just believed in you know taking all these different disciplines, finding the best of them, and what works on the street. And later on, he started uh, the American, what was it, American Karate Association, or Kempo Association? Yes. Yeah, he did that more because the students that he had, it seems like when they came, they wanted to have this belt system so right. they could say, I'm a brown belt, I'm a right. black belt, or whatever. And John just believed as long as you could do right. what you intended right. to do, you didn't need a belt. Well, and I think part of that was, my understanding was part of that influence was from um, uh, Tom Saviano, who came from a more traditional background as well in martial yeah. arts, and said, hey, you know, people really want some sort of recognition of their, pr their progress. And belts have been kind of ingrained in this country as showing how far you've gotten, even though, practically speaking, whether you have a white belt or a black belt, if you prevail in a self-defense situation, it doesn't right. matter, right? Right. Um, now, one of the other students and um, instructors that he worked with was Ray Corda. Yes. Now, you told me that during um, one of the filming sessions that you had that uh, there was a bit of an incident that occurred. Yeah, we were, we were filming in an alley by a dumpster, and uh, the technique was the uh, hammer fist to the brainstem, which Sean would explain your brainstem's like a flower, and you hit <laughs> it, and it just snaps. So... <laughs> John just barely tapped Ray, and Ray is huge. He's a weightlifter, big guy. He worked uh, for a beer company carrying oh, okay. the barrels. Oh, okay. So he, he was He was, immense. I remember him being quite And John like just that. gave him a little tap, and he went down, and he was out. And it was just, it was amazing. Wow. And John always, the other thing he always used to show was uh, he would show the power that he could take his hands, he would have you stand right by him and go like that, and he would just push you across the room, which just, it was amazing. Yeah, no, he was very powerful uh, striker, no question about it. One of the tapes I know you've got here is Power Strikes, and he was big on trying to teach people how to take a few simple strikes and really generate a lot of power from right. them. Right, so. right. One of the big things he talked about a lot, which is just ingrained in my mind, is the hand yoke to the neck, yes. because the neck is one of the weakest points. And, you know, you hit someone like that, 
And to finish it off, he would tell me, then you just Reach pull it around and <laughs> yank it out. And if you do it just right, the guy won't die for a week. So I, I thought that was kind of interesting. <laughs> so if you want to pre-plan someone's yeah. uh, demise, okay. Uh, so anything else you would like to share with us about John that you thought was interesting or different? Yeah, about John him? was uh, close with Ed Parker. Uh, he was, you know, John was one of his first students. He taught Elvis Presley, and Ed Parker came in to town for an event, and we got to meet him, oh, we recorded okay. all his people. Yeah, and we did an interview with him, which I, I haven't been able to dig up again. Okay. I don't know if I saved it. But it was really interesting. And John, when we were there, he was talking about Ed Parker and that John's strikes were stripped down. Yes. And he told us that Ed Parker, he figured, well, as long as he's in there, doing this, he might as well like rip the guy's eyes out, pull his ears out, <laughs> and do a couple other things. Yeah. So it was just interesting. No, it's true. I mean, I think uh, when I look at what Ed Parker does, it, to me it's more complex, and uh, John made it very simple. He had just this list of like 26 basic yeah. techniques against no fancy names. It's just, you know, front choke or two-handed grab or something, and um, a few things for dealing with that. So I liked his yeah. very direct approach. And he so. always believed that Self-defense, hand-to-hand was the tack hammer. The sludge hammer was the gun. Yeah. And when we did arm self-defense, he came to the studio and he had rubber bullets. And he had like a 38, uh, uh, 45, and he was telling me, oh, don't worry, don't worry. You know, the bullets, they'll just bounce off the wall. So he started shooting the wall and there's like all holes in the <laughs> wall. <laughs> <It's> like, okay. <laughs> well, uh, feeling is believing. Yeah. Um, so... Well, that's all the questions I've got for you. It sounds like you had a very interesting uh, experience working with John. It was quite a few years. Yeah, I managed like, so. him probably from 1980 all the way up to just about 2000. Okay. So until he went down to Florida. And then retired to Florida. Yeah. yeah. And then I believe after that he was doing some seminars but wasn't really doing much. Yeah, no, he that, was so. kind of laid back. And it was funny because I called him back because I was starting to get some uh, initiative with him again. Whatever was happening at the time, it might have been the Gulf War. Then I call up, and then Marianne told me, oh, he passed away. So I right. just, I was surprised. Yeah. So. Uh, People like that, you expect to live forever, yeah, right? Yeah, so. Well, John was kind of intense. He died of a heart attack, so it kind of fits in if you knew John's personality, because my favorite thing was, and everyone knew I could do it, you ask him the right questions, you tweak them, and all of a sudden you get red, and he'd start flailing away <laughs> and hitting, and tiger moves, <laughs> and everything else, so. That passion comes out. Yeah. So, yeah. All right, well, thank you very much, Alan. I appreciate your time. Okay, thanks for having me. Thank you, everybody, for watching my interview with Alan Lusk today about John McSweeney. I also previously did an interview with Mike Fasolo, also talking about John, his experiences with John, and some of the books that Mike had written about uh, self-defense. For more content, feel free to visit my Facebook page or subscribe to my YouTube channel, Best Defense Concepts. Thanks again.